So hello, my name is Bernardo. Uh, we're going to be talking about Lambda Calculus, and we're going to be playing a little bit around with that uh, in Elixir, just like implementing some things and seeing uh, how it kind of works. So I'm going to start with some background, uh, so a little bit of history. So Lambda Calculus was invented in 1936 by this folk here, Alonzo Church. Uh, he was trying to define what computability means, so he's trying to like formalize uh, what kinds of functions were computable or not. So he created all this lambda calculus thing just to, um, yeah, the, the study was about computability. Uh, that was a huge thing back then. Actually, uh, this was like published one month earlier than the than Alan Turing paper uh, that was trying to do the same thing. Alan Turing took a completely different route and defined the um, Turing machines that we talk about. Uh, and basically, they, they, they talk about the same thing. And funny enough, uh, a little bit later, it was proven to be actually equivalent. So people realized that the, the, the set of functions that lambda calculus uh, defined is the exact same one that Turing machines define. So the thing is, you can, uh, you can implement uh, lambda calculus using a Turing uh, machine, and you can do it uh, the other way around. And actually, up until this, this day, nobody came up with another like Form formality, form formalized way of doing uh, computation that created like a superset of that. So that's people what people normally say about Turing completeness is that you can implement all the sets, uh, all the computable functions as defined um, by the Turing machine or lambda calculus. Um, yeah. So let's go back uh, and talk about lambda calculus. So lambda calculus is this formalism that's trying to define uh, computability. It kind of built on the idea of computable functions by simplifying them really much. So all the functions are anonymous, so we don't, don't give named functions. Uh, and all the functions are curried. That means that all functions receive exactly one argument. And I mean, uh, just like just an overview, this, this talk's going to be really <laughs> over the top, uh, not, not like that deep. Uh, and also defines a syntax to define lambda terms that he uses in his paper. Uh, and the syntax allows three types of constructs. So you can have uh, variables, so variables is like a name you give to something. Uh, and you have abstractions, which is basically a function uh, definition, uh, which defines, uh, like, which abstracts a variable. So that's how, you, that's how you get a name. So you just use the lambda, the Greek letter lambda. Uh, fun fact, I mean, it could be anything. You call it lambda calculus because of that, but basically he just chose lambda because there are people using other like sigmas or whatever. Uh, and then a dot, and then everything on the right is the body of the function of the abstraction. I'm going to use these words like interchangeably. Um, and, and then you can do application of two of them, because everything is a function, right? So you can apply one function to another by just placing them like with a space, kind of similar to how you do in Haskell, uh, if you've ever done that. But anyway, so also application is left associative. That means uh, ABC uh, is basically applied uh, A to input B, and then get that and apply to input C. Uh, so if you want to change the order, you can also use parentheses to change the order of application. Uh, and you can also use parentheses to delimit like uh, where uh, abstraction of function definition ends because everything to the right is is the body so you can put that inside a parentheses so you say, you say hey this is where my function ends so what types of like terms you can construct with that so uh, you can construct all these kinds of stuff you can do like very complicated stuff you can do simple one like the, the one that just returns whatever it receives so the first one is like uh, receives an argument and returns that without doing anything and the last one receives two things, and then apply the first one to the second one uh, four times. Uh, OK, so let's uh, go ahead, uh, go, go back and, and try to play around with these kind of ideas in Elixir. So I'm going to do that by proposing a weird challenge that is programming Elixir using only a specific subset of Elixir. So you can construct like an Elixir term uh, that, uh, only by d using variable names. <laughs> and you can define anonymous functions like, like this thing here. Uh, just use the fn keyword and then put the body. I mean, we could, do, we could be doing that in Erlang. Doesn't matter the language. Just, just use Elixir because, yeah. Um, and then you can also apply one function to another. In Elixir, you do the dot and then the parentheses, and that's all you can do, right? Uh, so what kinds of things you can write? Well, you can write these kind of things. Uh, you can write a simple function that just returns the, the, the first argument it receives. You can do the f complex function that receives two things and apply the first one uh, four times to the first thing. And if you, if you look, uh, it's quite similar to that because it's basically the same idea. Um, so yeah, so the funny thing is that if you program Elixir that way, that is actually Turing complete. So can, all computable functions can be represented in Elixir like that. So if you don't trust me, I'm going to show you a factorial function implemented like that. So this is the factorial function. <laughs> I mean, right, I mean, when, when I look at that, it will be like, what, what is even going on? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, so, but I mean, you can go ahead and you can put that in your Elixir shell, and then you can actually call that and, and, and calculate a factorial. But there's a catch because 
it only works with functions. So everything's a function. So you cannot like take an elixir number and put on that. So imagine for a while that you have these two functions that convert an elixir number to a lambda uh, kind of encoded version of this number, call the factorial, and then get the, fa the encoded number and, and convert back. Well, actually, I have that in my shell already, so I can go ahead and do that. And yeah, indeed, factorial 5 is 120. So I mean, the first time that I that I met, I was playing around that, and then I yeah, this looks completely weird, but it works, and I was like completely mind blown. Uh, and then I was like, okay, this is too complex, but how do I explain how to build those things? So we're going to start from the beginning with a simple uh, lambda term. So that is the identity function. One could say that only the variable name is a valid, but that that uh, variable would be unbounded, so uh, it's not a valid thing because it's nothing, doesn't mean anything. So this is like the smallest uh, meaningful thing. This is the identity function. In Elixir, it would be something like that. So, okay, let's start a new Elixir shell and try to create the factorial function. Not going to get there because of the time, but let's try to do something starting from scratch. So, okay, I'm gonna put the ID, uh, the ID function. I'm going to use also re reference to unbounded variables here just to make things easy so we can do things uh, uh, part by, uh, block by block. Um, but, okay, so then I can pass anything to my ID function, it just returns it to me. But, I mean, true is not an encoded, it's not a lambda term. So that got us thinking, how can I encode Boolean values in lambda terms? So what I mean, I want to encode uh, true and false using only functions. Uh, so one thing is there are infinite ways of doing that. It's proven to, to have infinite ways of doing that. Uh, so the way we're going to get to one uh, way of encoding is by thinking, what do you use Booleans for? So normally, we use Booleans for branching. We want to pick, like we have an if-then-else, we want to pick one of two paths. So we know that, I mean, uh, a Boolean will be some function, right? Everything's a function, so we can start with something. So it's some, a function that receives something and do something. So if you want to make the Boolean uh, choose between two things, why don't we just send those two things to the Boolean? So Boolean can be a function that receives two things, the then and the else, and it chooses one of them depending on whether it's encoding true or false. So true will be encoded as a function that receives two things and returns the first one, and false would be encoded as a thing that choose, receives two things and returns the second one. Uh, yeah, and then this is what is called like church booleans, the church encoding for booleans or whatever, because church uh, got to this encoding is like one of the simplest ones. Um, and then an elixir could like go ahead and implement a function like that. Uh, so I can go ahead and put those things in our shell, and if I call the true with two things, true is going to choose the first one, and false is going to choose the second one. So I'm already doing some kind of like if then else here. So okay, but there's a problem if you look at what true and false returns, it's just a function. I mean, don't you say, right? <laughs> Everything's a function. So it's not very helpful because you're going to do some operations on that, so we need a way to decode that, like convert that to an elixir boolean again. So we need a way to check the result, so we're going to cheat and we're going to basically, because we can, we can do that because it's in Elixir land, so we can just pass whatever thing to the function. So we're going to apply a known uh, lambda term to our lambda term that is a Boolean, so something like that. We get the Boolean and apply just true and false, the, the atoms true and false to that, and the Boolean will choose true atom if it's representing true. So I can go ahead and implement that thing in our shell, and indeed, true is true and false, false, okay? They haven't done any mistake right until this point. So if we have some encoding for Booleans, it would be useful if you could use that to do some operations, right? Because if you have just an encoding thing and you can only do that, I mean, what can you do, right? So we can try to implement a negation function. So a negation function, if it receives the Boolean true, should return false. If it receives false, should return true. So okay, we know it is a function that receives a Boolean A and should return the opposite of A, right? And we also know that A itself is a Boolean, so it's a function that when passed two things, is going to choose the first one if A is true and the second one if it's A is false. So I can just put false and true like inverted, and then A is going to choose its opposite when called. Uh, so I can go ahead, implement that thing in Elixir, put that thing in a shell, and we see that indeed the negation of true is false and negation of false is true. Uh, so yeah, we, we kind of like using only function, we're already doing something with our encoded values. So let's try something that is a little bit more complicated. Let's try to do an end function. So an end function basically it receives two booleans A and B and returns true only if those two things are true, otherwise returns false for all other combinations. So okay, we know it's a function that receives two things. So okay, we know that end is a, like, kind of do like a short circuit on, on false. So it, each one of them is false, everything should be false. So we can look at any one of them. So let's look first at A. So we know that A will choose some thing depends on whether it's true or false. And we know if A is false, everything should be false. So we can just put false in the last thing. Um, and okay, you have uh, that, but if A is true, it's going to choose the first one. And the value of the computation will be at whether or not B is true or false. And that's just B, so I can go ahead and do that. 
so basically that will, uh, is our end function. I can go ahead and implement that in Elixir, put that thing in our shell, and indeed and true, true is, is true when all the other combinations are false. Um, okay, so what about other logic gates? Well, I don't need to show all the logic gates because we already have not an end, and you, ha you can do, it's proven that you can do like all the possible logic gates using only not an end. Uh, that is the NAND logic, so you can construct like everything. And there's a book called NAND to Tetris, so I, can, I guess you can go to Tetris with that. <laughs> so anyway, so let's try to encode uh, more complicated stuff. So let's try to encode natural numbers. So what I mean, I want to encode uh, numbers from 0, 1, 2, 3, and 2, whatever number I want. Again, there are infinite ways of encoding numbers using functions, so we're going to ask the same questions. What do you use natural numbers for? Uh, so natural numbers are really useful for counting things, like how many people are in this room, how many, uh, I don't know, dollars I have in my bank account, counting things. Um, yeah, so the, the, the encoding that I'm going to present you is church numbers. Again, church invented that thing as well. Uh, so uh, the way uh, church does that is he uses the, the, the encoded version to count how many times a given function is applied to a given input. That means if I want to represent the natural number n, it's basically a function that receives two things and apply the first one for, uh, n times to the second one. Basically, the, the more complicated uh, ver function that I showed on the, the first slides uh, is were, were four, representing four. So what I mean is that zero is basically receives two things, just returns the second thing. Uh, one uh, re uh, receives two things and apply the first one to the second one one time. Uh, two does that two times and so on. Uh, but also, I don't want to like hard code all these kind of things in my shell to be able to do some computation. So I need a way to kind of construct natural numbers like by induction so we can define zero. So if you have zero uh, and then we have a way to get n plus one given n, n natural number n, then we can get all possible natural numbers. So zero, zero we already have, right? It's just this function. Uh, so in Elixir it would be something like that. I had to put underscore otherwise Elixir would like yell at me. Uh, and then I can go ahead and think about the successor function. So this is, is, this is probably going to be the, the trickiest one. <laughs> so successor function receives a, a, a lambda encoded uh, number n and should return n plus 1. So basically we know that we're going to return a number and we know how a number looks like. So number looks like this function that applies f to x n plus 1 times. So we, if to, in order to apply n plus 1 times, we need to first apply n times, and we already know how to apply n times, because n does exactly like that. So if I just call n with f and x, you just apply n to f and then apply that to x, that's going to return f applied to x n times. So okay, but now I need to apply f one more time, so I just need to put another f in that, and then I can, uh, and then I can create, and this is the successor, successor function. It looks like a little bit funky the first time you look at it, but basically you are applying n times and applying one more time. So, okay, so we can omit some parentheses, go ahead and implement that in Elixir, uh, and then we can go ahead, put the thing, the thing in our shell, and then we can construct things. But again, I mean, if you look at the result of 0, 1, and 2, they are just functions, right? Again, I mean, of course, everything is a function. So we need a way to kind of like convert between Elixir numbers and church numerals. Uh, I was thinking about ex skipping this part and not, not explaining, but uh, I'll try to do if I run out of time, sorry. Um, you can beat me later, I don't know. <laughs> so basically, the, the, in order to convert a, a, a function that is encoded, a number that is encoding lambda, uh, encoding to uh, Elixir, basically what n does is apply a function to a given input n times, so it just can just start with zero and then apply plus, plus one n times. So that is how you, co you convert from uh, uh, lambda encoded to elixir numbers. And the other thing is basically this complicated thing that we just apply su the successor function we define, starting the zero function we, we define. So basically applying, yeah, so that's a simple thing. So we can go ahead, implement that thing, put it in our shell, and then we can go ahead and, and check if we did anything wrong. So yeah, zero is representing zero, one is representing one, two is representing two, and you can also get an elixir number 10, convert to, uh, to a lambda encoded version of that, do some operation using only lambda calculus, and then convert back to uh, elixir number and see that indeed 11 comes right after 10. So actually this, this function was the, first, the function that I showed you earlier. So let's try to do some more complicated function like addi addition, not addiction, that's weird. <laughs> uh, so addition uh, works something like that. So a plus zero is just a. a plus one is successor of a, a plus two is successor of successor of a. Uh, so in general, a plus b is basically the result of applying a successor function b times to a. And guess what? What function can we use that, uh, that does something b times? 
right? So we need a way to apply successor to A, B times. So we already have B, B exactly, because B is encoding a number that does exactly that, apply a function B times to a given input. So I can start with A and do something. And this something is basically a successor function. So this thing is going to apply successor function B times to A, which is the result of the addition of A plus B. So I can go ahead, implement that in Elixir, uh, and then I can put the thing in our shell, and I can see that indeed 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 2 plus 2 is 4. So we're already doing some kind of mathematical operations on numbers. So in, if I would stop here, I would be like already satisfied that I kind of showed that this thing kind of works. Uh, but let's try to do something else, just for trying to reinforce the idea. So multiplication again. Uh, a times zero is just zero, a times one is just one, a times two is just two, and, and a times any natural number b is basically you start with zero and then add a b times. So again, you have, to, you have to add a to zero b times. So again, what function does something b times is b itself. And then we just need a way to add a to that. Uh, and that, how can you do that? Okay, you can create a function that basically receives anything and then calls add with a and that thing. But the thing is, all the functions here are curried, right? Because all the functions, uh, everything in lambda calculus is curried. So if I, if I apply a to uh, add to a, it's going to return a function that add a to any natural number. So I can just go ahead and implement it like that. So I can go ahead and implement this thing in Elixir, and then I can go ahead and put that thing in a shell, and then, and then yeah, 5 times 10 is uh, 50. Uh, we are like a long way, I mean, this is kind of like ending already, sorry, because <laughs> we don't have that much time. But uh, this is already like, uh, what, what can we do next in order to, uh, to uh, I mean, go to factorial function? Uh, in order to implement like a recursive factorial, we need a lot of things. So one of the things you need is a predecessor function, and you might think, Oh, if the successor function is easy, I guess the predecessor function is also easy, but I mean it's not. <laughs> it's this weird thing here just to, to there's a, a more intuitive way of doing that, but you have to encode, encode pairs and do some stuff like that. But this is like the, the normal one, basically it tries to apply, apply the one function that the first time you stop applying, so it kind of applies the function one last time, it's kind of a weird thing. Uh, and also we'd need, uh, that's where things normally get complicated because you remember that functions are all anonymous. So uh, if functions are anonymous, then there's no way to do recursion uh, like in a simple way because you cannot refer to yourself by name because you don't have a name. So recursion is something that is a little bit complicated in lambda calculus. I'm not going to show anything, but basically uh, you, what you need to do is that you need, uh, the way you do is that you create a function that is an abstract version of your function, and then you just receive the concrete version of your function as an argument, and then you have to do some kind of magic and that this thing called fixed point combinators. Uh, so if you heard about like Y combinator and Z combinator or whatever, uh, not the accelerator thing. Uh, so they basically, they, they, are, they are like something, uh, someone find out, actually, actually Haskell Curry found out that uh, there's this kind of like neat lambda expression that when you apply that something is going to apply that thing to itself like infinite times. So then you can do like recursion. So I mean that for now we don't, we don't have the time to get into that. So that's that's it for now. Thank you everyone. If you want, if anyone wants to get like some examples because I, I gave this uh, like a I have this this uh, Git repository with all like with all my slides and st stuff like that. And then there's all all the examples that I put on the shell. You can copy that and then run that thing. In, in your thing and play around lambda calculus. So that's it for now. Thank you.